Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. And welcome to today's online program at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Denise Michaud, Chair of the Grown Ups Forum and your host for today. Our program is The Perils of Dementia and Your Money. So you may want to be taking some notes. I'm very pleased to introduce you to our three special guests. First, we have Dr. Catherine Madison. Dr. Madison is a neurologist. She founded the Ray Dolby Brain Health Center in San Francisco and introduced um, a, the first holistic approach to diagnosing and caring for patients with dementia. She is also a dementia consultant with Seniors at Home, a leading home care agency in the San Francisco Bay Area. Next, we have Gretchen Holstein. She is a wealth advisor with over 25 years of experience in financial planning and wealth management. She's been recognized by Forbes as one of best in state and also one of the top wealth advisors, women wealth advisors in the country. We also have Natalie O, oh, an insurance professional with over 25 years of insurance and financial planning experience. Her legal background brings an enhanced level of expertise to her clients. So each of our speakers will give a short presentation and towards the end, we'll have time for your questions. We encourage everybody to type in your questions and your thoughts in the YouTube chat area. So first let's talk, turn and talk to Dr. Madison who will help us understand a little bit more about what dementia is. Thank you very much for that introduction, Denise, and thank you everyone for being with us today. So what I would like to start with here is money and the perils of a dementia. As Denise mentioned, I would like to give everybody a little bit of background as to what types of dementia there are, what is going on in the brain that makes it difficult to plan for the future and even communicate with people who have cognitive impairment. And you'll all have to bear with me as I manage changing these slides. And, hmm, oh dear, sorry about this. Now I'm having trouble moving slides. There we go. Okay, I'm still catching up with the technology here. Uh, and so I'd like to start with talking about what a dementia is. And so I think it's important for everybody to understand that dementia is not always a specific diagnosis. Uh, it's a clinical syndrome. When you think of something like chest pain, you think, oh my goodness, that could be a heart attack, but it could also be other things. It can be reflux, it, uh, you know, uh, irritation of the, the ribs, costochondritis, it can be different things. And so a dementia is similar to chest pain in that it's a collection of symptoms. We mostly notice uh, loss of memory, problems with planning, thinking, judgment, or language. And when there are changes or declines in one's ability to do those normal things and it interferes with their independent function on a day-to-day -day basis, that is a dementia. Provided, of course, we haven't found anything else which is causing these problems, and we'll touch on that in a little, just a minute. It's estimated that there are 6.2 million Americans living with Alzheimer's. That's a whole lot of our population. And there was unfortunately an increase in individuals' deaths with Alzheimer's over the last year with the COVID pandemic related to isolation. Seniors are at higher risk for dementia. Obviously, age is the biggest risk factor. And we're gathering here today to talk about financial planning because 
in seniors are at risk for financial abuse. And as you will come to understand, they frequently can't see it themselves. They can't see where they're having trouble. And that's where family members and friends need to step in. There are different types of dementia. They're grouped according to the, the clinical signs, you know, what patients and families see and what a doctor finds on testing. Alzheimer's disease is the most common of those. Over 60% of dementia cases are Alzheimer's. And memory loss is usually the most prominent symptom. And I'm talking about new memory, newly learned information. Remote memory remains intact most of the time at any rate. There's also vascular dementia. So if someone has a stroke and damages a large region of their brain, I think everybody can understand it doesn't work as well as it used to, and it can be severe enough to be classified as a dementia. In addition to a large stroke, though, there can be very, very small strokes that happen in the brain. These can interrupt the normal means of communication, and they can cause significant enough damage to actually be classified as a dementia. To add to the confusion, I'm going to have to add that sometimes these things are even mixed together. The pathological changes, the abnormal proteins that accumulate in the brain can be mixed. Lewy body disorders uh, have a different protein that accumulates in the brain, and there is Lewy body dementia, but similar changes are found in Parkinson's disease dementia. In these disorders, there are prominent difficulties with visual spatial skills. People are prone to misperception, hallucinations. They also have what we call motor signs and symptoms. They can have stiffness, tremor. They're at high risk for falls and injury. And then there's the group called frontotemporal lobar dementias. In this group of disorders, language is typically the prominent difficulty. There are also significant behavior changes, and this group of dementias can be especially challenging. Now, what about this concept of quote-unquote reversible dementias? I think everybody can understand if we're sick enough, um, if we have an illness or an infection, our brain's not working normally. If we don't get enough sleep, uh, sleep is incredibly important. It is not a passive state, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but that's something that doctors need to look into. If there are vitamin deficiencies or hormonal imbalances that can be corrective, corrected, cognitive decline can be stopped or reversed. So the doctors need to look for these treatable things. I have depression listed there. Last, it's rather unique in that it can be a, both a symptom of a dementia early in the course. It can be a sign that emerges later in the course of a neurodegenerative condition. Uh, and it also is a risk factor. So why diagnose early a disease that is incurable? And I think doctors are guilty of this as well because doctors are more trained to wanna to fix something and we can't fix dementias. However, there is substantial evidence from what we've learned with treating other chronic illnesses like heart disease and HIV and some cancers that we can certainly mitigate the effects and potentially prolong life. So we do need to try and diagnose earlier. And then of course, there's that horrific failure rate of the research trials and only by getting patients into research, research trials earlier, can we find better treatments? And again, seniors are at high risk for financial abuse. So they not, may not be aware of their deficits. We need to all help them figure this out and plan for the future. What about the concept of self-screening? It's not a bad idea. So what you see on your screens there is something which I took from a cognitive screen called the AD8, developed by Dr. Galvin when he was at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And I took most of the points from his screen and put them on your slide here. 
And ask yourself or think about a loved one. Over the last few years, have you noticed a significant change or decline in your problem-solving abilities, in your judgment, in your engagement in hobbies or activities, in your ability to keep track of appointments? Has there been an increase in repetition of questions or comments? A whole lot more trouble in learning how to use a new tool or electronic gadget? Or keeping track of the current month or year? Now, I am not saying the day or the date because we can all miss that now and then. So if you have noticed any of those things or you have noticed it in a loved one, I would encourage you to take that list I had on the prior slide, take it to your doctor and request or even demand an evaluation. Now, what I'm talking about here, I've got to simply put out there on the table, is, is an existential crisis. I'm asking you to think about and plan around something that is absolutely terrifying, depressing, and anxiety-provoking, um, because no one wants to think about a neurodegenerative disease that's going to very slowly and silently steal your thinking and your memory, ultimately leaving you unable to care for yourself. However, I'm going to encourage you to jump into that conversation because we have to, or you will hear examples today about what can happen if we don't. So what I have here is a, a game called Go Wish. And on our, our summary page, we've actually got the website where you can get this. So this is a card game. So I've got a couple of the cards here and you take the cards describe different choices or preferences towards the end of your life. And you can do this at any point in time. Heck, I've done it with my kids who are in their 30s. And you sort the cards into what's the most important to you, what's of medium importance, and what's not important at all. So for instance, I would take mm, not dying alone, and I'm not sure about that. I think I might be okay with dying alone. But not being connected to machines, that goes in my important pile. So once you've got those three piles, then you sort them again, one through 10. And it's a great way to start a conversation about what is important. I will frequently ask clients or patients, you know, do you have an advanced directive? And the most common answer I get is, yeah, we've already done that. Then I'll ask them, um, where is it? Oftentimes they don't know. I'm hoping this is a better educated audience here, however. But I'd like to point out that what is in the typical boilerplate advanced directive looks at conditions one faces when they're in an irreversible coma, they're connected to life support, and whether or not it's okay for a designated agent, typically a family member, to turn off the machines because there isn't a meaningful chance of a good outcome from that scenario. Well, this type of a decision point does not typically present itself when you have a neurodegenerative illness or a dementia because a neurodegenerative illness spreads through the brain over years and decades. So oftentimes when you feel you have done an advanced directive, you haven't really addressed a lot of the other major decision points. And talking about those decision points and communicating with people with cognitive impairment is more challenging. I mean, for those of you that think it's really hard, you're right. I want to talk a moment about something called anosognosia. Anosognosia is lack of of insight, meaning that the individual who has a difficulty, or we call it a deficit, cannot see it. It is not denial. And anosognosia results from structural changes in the brain that normally facilitate referential thinking. So when someone says to you, I don't have any trouble with that, and you have seen them have difficulty repeatedly, it's not that they're denying it. They honestly don't have the ability to see it. And this can be a huge obstacle for evaluation and planning. The person who has impairment simply cannot see the need for it. So this condition is severe in about one third 
of individuals with Alzheimer's disease and present to variable amounts in many of the others. There's increased risk for anosognosia with lower educational level and for individuals who have more behavioral difficulties. Then there is another condition um, and that is the ability to mentally simulate potential events at a future point in time and prospection. And lack of prospection is also markedly impaired in many of the dementia syndromes. I'm not saying just Alzheimer's here. So prospection is what we use when we're planning something in the future. For instance, when you're talking about making plans for the holidays this year, that requires future-oriented thinking. As you're planning for the holidays this year, you need to retrieve personal life details. What happened last year? What went well? What didn't? You need to understand relationships in time and space, who's in town, who's not. You need to consider the risks of different scenarios. Personally, I spend a lot of time on table arrangements. Okay, now I'm talking about the holidays here, and what we're talking about this morning is financial planning. I was simply trying to use an example that I think we can all understand, um, but the financial planning falls under this same scenario. So in summary, I hope that everybody has been able to take away from this that dementia or neurodegenerative illness and Alzheimer's are common in this country. It's growing with the aging of our population. And almost every minute, someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's in this country, clearly outlining what you want and almost more clearly what you don't want at future stages in your life. Should you come down with this type of a condition, helps your family and loved ones make decisions related to your care in the future, if indeed you end up in a position where you cannot make those decisions for yourself. Um, Go Wish is a great conversation starter. And we're also going to provide the link for Prepare for Your Care, which is a wonderful advanced directive that allows one to prioritize quality of life versus quantity of life. And I encourage everybody to start these conversations and think about this potentially in their future because confronting mortality in our own life can enhance the joy that we are experiencing today. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope this has been useful and I have contact information there. And oops, sorry, I went the wrong way there. It's amazing how now that button works. It didn't work earlier. And this is the contact information for seniors at home. Thank you again. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Madison. You know, I want to ask you something before you move on to Gretchen. And that is, um, we're seeing, it's not, you were saying we're seeing more cases of dementia. Is it that we have more cases or do you think they the healthcare field is understanding dementia better or the better testing? What's what's happening, do you think? I think that's combined to a lot of different factors, Denise. Um, our longevity has increased um, pretty much. I mean, there was a recent dip in, in that, but but we, we are living longer. We have uh, achieved better control other, over other chronic conditions, which used to take us earlier. Uh, We are looking for it more. There may be some environmental factors that are contributing to it as well. It's a combination of different things. Thank you very much. So let's hear from Gretchen Holstein. And Gretchen, you have had some experiences with dementia too, not only in your personal life, but professional life as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Denise. And thank you, Dr. Madison. I do want to talk a little bit, first of all, about why this topic is so important to me and why it has touched me personally. And that is that I I, I went through this experience with my own family. Um, my, my father was an electrical engineer, and uh, he taught me how to use tools 
and how to fix things, but he also taught me how to budget and how to think about finances. And I, I credit that experience with him with my eventual work in uh, finances and financial management um, and wealth management. Um, he was a good planner as well. <clears throat> so he did save. Uh, he had resources. He had invested. He had long-term care insurance, and he had a good long-term care insurance plan. Um, and he also had an estate plan with backup decision makers. So he did everything that he could to control the things that he could. But eventually, as Dr. Madison has talked about, his judgment started to wane. Um, we experienced a slow loss of uh, his short-term memory, and uh, he, he did struggle with Alzheimer's until he passed away a few years ago. I just want to let everyone know that because he planned ahead, he did control, he, he created an environment where as much as he can control was, was helped, but it was still hard. It's still hard to, um, to work through this with a family member. But what I appreciate is that all that planning allowed us to focus on having moments of joy with him. And that's what I try to pass along to you today is how to put a plan together so that you can focus on these moments of joy. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit here is um, what you want to be planning for, how to put a team in place to help you. From a financial perspective, some tips on financial accounts, investment accounts, some simplification, arranging ownership, and then I have a few last tips for some uh, financial and non-financial resources. So as Dr. Madison said, um, a lot of people don't know when they are heading into some kind of dementia, and it is a slow progression. So when I talk to my clients about planning ahead for this, these are the things that I often hear. We're healthy now. We don't have a history of dementia in our family. We're Our family will know what to do when we get to that point. And we'll take care of this when we need to. And my goal is really to help them think about these things before they are needed. And maybe they will never come about, but best time to think about it is before some of those steps of dementia start. So what I'd like you all to think about is what not to do. First of all, if you have someone in your family who is very intelligent and financially savvy, it behooves you to not assume that they have everything covered. Um, I, I witnessed this firsthand with a family that I worked with who the, the father in the family was a high powered attorney, very intelligent on top of everything as far as the family knew. But too late, they discovered that his dementia had started to set in. He had a couple of professionals that were working with him that were actually taking advantage of him, overcharging him and not actually helping him put steps in place. And when he passed away, he had a very large multi-million dollar IRA that had no beneficiaries listed. It's one of the basic steps of estate planning is to put your beneficiaries on retirement accounts. And because he had no beneficiaries, the IRA had to be distributed taxable and the family lost about half of the IRA to taxes. So we wanna make sure that we don't assume that someone has it covered. The second thing is that you can't wait to set these things up, um, beneficiaries or other legal documents, when you start to see cognitive decline, because by that time, the person who needs to sign the documents may not be able to sit in front of a notary and show that they understand what they're signing. They, As Dr. Madison said, they may be able to tell you the story of their family history, but they may not understand the current situation that they're trying to assess. So um, I've seen this before where um, family members of my clients who uh, their, their father was um, very financially astute had some documents in place, but began to show poor judgment on who he was trusting. And eventually they found that some of the documents that he had been asked to sign ended up gifting away some property to someone who was not a family member. And it took them lots of time and dollars with many attorneys to redo some of his documents to make sure that they could help protect him going forward. 
And lastly, I'll say a lot of people will say to me, well, I have a will in place, so I've got the document that I need. But a will, especially in California, is not enough to cover all of the decisions and all of the backup decision makers that you would want to have in place. And it also causes everything in your estate and all of your finances to go through public probate court. And it it is not an easy process. Um, And in fact, even when people tell me they have a will, often I'll find out it was written a long time ago. Um, And in some cases, you might be surprised to find a family member only had a written will from many, many years ago. Um, One of the people I'm working with now had a family member that died suddenly, and they discovered that the only will he had in place was written many years ago when he was younger, and he left his entire estate to a childhood nonprofit organization. And he had become a multi, multi millionaire, and the family had to go through a lot of years in court arguing that he should have had more updated documents. So, what we're going to talk about today is first, how to avoid these situations, because I want to make sure everyone here is planning ahead. The first step is to make sure that you have a team in place that you can trust. So on this slide, I've mentioned a number of different responsibilities in that team. These can be professionals, like a professional investment advisor and planner, an attorney and trustee and so on. But they can also be family members that step in and take over these roles. I do know people who have a family member or even a friend who's really good at investments or planning ahead and can help them with these roles. Certainly, the attorney would need to be professional. An insurance provider would need to be a professional. And your CPA would be important to be a professional helping you with taxes. But if you have all of these responsibilities covered and in that you've set up who your successor decision makers are, and in this case, it could be a successor trustee on a trust or a power of attorney, someone who can help you take over um, making decisions for uh, your IRA account or even some uh, other assets that aren't in the name of a trust. If you have this team in place, they can all be working together. Wouldn't it even be wonderful if you had them all get together once a year, maybe at a holiday or at another time to just talk about what your wishes are and make sure that everyone's coordinated. So that's my first tip, put together the right team. My second set of tips here is just to start simplifying the what can become cumbersome investment accounts. Uh, This is, I think, one of the things that I do with clients that ends up becoming one of the most beneficial things that we do is that we consolidate all their taxable assets. This is just regular investment accounts, could be money that was at a bank, all into a trust. And the trust then reads like a will and says what should happen in the next stages um, of their lives and who would back them up. If you can consolidate that all down into one trust account, even better, only one account to take to, uh, take into account at tax time and cash flow needs. The other is to consolidate retirement accounts. 401k plans, 403b plans, and other retirement plans can be rolled into an IRA, and each person can have their own IRA. If you consolidate those down to one IRA, it also helps around the time of minimum distribution calculations, tax reporting, and investment management. So the more we can help people consolidate into one taxable side or or really after-tax investment side and one pre-tax investment side of their savings, the easier the reporting and the easier it is for your backup decision makers to help you. The last thing I'll mention is that um, I often hear family members saying that they uh, have a checking account and the checking account isn't in the name of the trust. That may not be a problem if it usually has a low balance, but it might be nice to have another person who could uh, write checks for you if needed. So having a second signature on it. Now, one of the one of the areas that gets complicated that I do help people with is understanding how different types of assets are owned and how those different ownership structures then lead to different 
backup decision makers. So I know this table is a little bit busy and it might be hard to see on screen, but I'll, I'll leave it up for a minute if you want to take a look through it with me. The There's a big difference between who backs you up on a retirement account versus who backs you up on a bank or trust investment account. So let's start with the retirement accounts. The IRS says that only one person's name can be listed as the owner of a retirement account. So you can't have a joint owner. You can't have a trust own your IRA account, which means that it's important that you have a person named who can take over as power of attorney on that account. Ideally, as durable power of attorney so that it their power is durable through any cognitive decline for you. And it's important then that you also make sure your beneficiary designations are up to date uh, based on that example I gave earlier. Now, this is different than a trust. An account that's owned by a trust, usually within the trust, has instructions for who the next decision makers would be and what situations spring their power into action. So it's important then that your trust reads the way you would like it to for who would be your successor trustee. And the decision on how those assets will be distributed might be similar to your beneficiaries, but they will be set up in the trust. A bank account I mentioned earlier can have a joint signer. It can even have a joint owner or can be in the name of a trust. And there are other accounts that have different kinds of owners and successor decision makers. So all of these are important to go through individually because they do have different roles. So for my, my kind of last tips, my five last tips for things to make it easier on you and your family. Um, whether or not you end up in a cognitive issue and a dementia issue, just even just for simplifying your lives as you get older. Um, the first one is not only to simplify your investment accounts, but within them to simplify the investments that you're making. Portfolio management becomes easier as you take away some of the more um, private investments or the um, not daily priced investments. So if it's important to your family to have things simplified, and I do help some of my clients with this, as, um, as they're getting older, we will simplify some of their investments as well as their investment accounts. The second thing is that wherever you have your investments at the a custodian or broker, um, in my case, I work often with Schwab and Fidelity, they often will ask you for what's called a trusted contact. A trusted contact is not someone who can make decisions for your account. It's someone who can help the custodian or the broker if they can't reach you or if they're, they're concerned about something for you. This is someone you would trust that they could call for a second opinion and to uh, make sure that things are, are right and, and help. So it's nice to have that kind of just backup personal contact with your custodian or broker. The other thing I would suggest is that tip number three. If you do have a power of attorney or a durable power of attorney that you've put together with your estate planner, they all are a little different from each other. And not all brokerage firms will feel comfortable with the language in each or every durable power of attorney document. So one thing I would suggest is before you ever need to use the durable power of attorney, Go to the brokerage firm and say, this is what my legal document looks like. If something were to happen and I needed this to spring into action, would you be able to follow the instructions here? And if they can't, they often have their own document that you could put in place and you've done it early enough. You can sign with a notary and make sure that all of your backup is set up. Tip number four is that some people don't have a family member or someone that they feel comfortable with making financial decisions for them. And that is absolutely fine. One of the options you have is to consider putting a professional fiduciary in as your successor trustee or your durable power of attorney. And um, I put here the organization of, of people who do this role professionally. It's a professional fiduciary association of California. So there are options for you to bring in a professional who at that time would spring into action. They do get paid, but they are a professional and could help with some of those decisions. And the last thing I'll say is just that 
there are other things that we want your family and uh, to know about besides just your investment accounts. And I, I do remind my clients about this. It can be um, as uh, just fun as where your photos are saved. I happen to save mine on Shutterfly. I make sure that my family knows the um, password to my Shutterfly account so they can get to my my pictures, but it could also be other online um, information or documents where your house keys are kept, where your car keys are kept, maybe even the um, access to your home security system, where how do your social security payments come in? Do you have a safe deposit box? All of these things are important to make sure that you have even just a letter or instructions together for someone to be able to help you access them if needed. So that's the end of my financial tips uh, for planning ahead. One of the other things that just from my heart that I'd like to remind people about is um, something that I think Dr. Madison touched on, which is that people who are beginning into the phases of dementia may not realize that, that this is happening to them. And they believe the things that they're telling you because they have lost some of the ability to have that short-term judgment. So, um, be patient with them. Try not to argue or tell them that they are wrong. Um, try not to remind them if they don't remember that someone dear to them has passed away. Uh, it's better not to bring up topics that might upset them. Uh, I've all, with my dad, I tried to move him towards something rather than pull him away from something. And, you know, he was always willing to help me if I asked him for help, but he might get frustrated if I asked him not to do something. So in some of these things I learned from a woman who did quite a bit of research and does education on working with people with dementia. Her name's Tipa Snow, and I left her website here at the bottom. So that's my, my, my heartfelt reminder for working with people who are struggling with dementia. So thank you, Denise. I'll look forward to questions. Okay. Thank you, Gretchen. And it sounds like you make it easy for your clients to get everything in order, but what if someone doesn't have their things in order, it can feel very daunting, I'm sure. What would be, maybe what's the document that they should like first do just to start the process? What would be the most important document to have, do you think? Yeah, I I think the most important step first Mm -hmm. is to uh, sit with an attorney, an estate planning attorney, to put together the will, possibly a trust, and the powers of attorney documents. At that time is usually when people also put together a healthcare directive. And I know Dr. Madison talked about that as well. So just that little collection of documents comes with that first meeting with an estate planning attorney. So I would say that's a good first step. Perfect, perfect. Well, let's turn to Natalie. Oh, thank you so much for being here, Natalie. And you're gonna share your also your professional and personal experiences with dementia. I am. Thank you very much. Um, And uh, thank you for having me here today uh, to talk about what I consider to be an incredibly important topic. But it's obviously one that's very uncomfortable for most people. And as Dr. Madison mentioned in the beginning, um, we don't want to know if we're going to have dementia, right? We don't want to know that we're going to be sick. We don't want to know that our family members are going to be in this position. Uh, And we really, really, really don't want to know whether or not we're financially prepared for it, right? These are all tough discussions to have. But as the resident insurance professional, I think it's incredibly important to have these discussions to understand what the perils are if we don't properly prepare. And I speak about this very passionately because um, like Gretchen, I experienced this personally. Um, And I think it's important for me to share with others, you know, what the perils are not only financially, but emotionally and physically, and not just for the person who's sick, but also for the other family members, because really this is a family problem. It's not just an individual problem. Um, And my goal here is also to uh, give you some simple steps that we can all um, implement to avoid the bigger pitfalls, because I believe absolutely that while, you know, you can't always control whether or not you get sick, we can control whether or not we plan for it. So my personal story, uh, this is my uh, family's last portrait together. My dad's 46 in this picture, and he would die three years later from complications due to hepatitis B. And at the time we learned about his illness, um, the doctors told us really there's nothing we could do. And we learned so late, um, his liver was so damaged and he was not a, a candidate for a liver transplant. And they said, you know, you should really prepare yourselves that he will be gone in less than a year. 
And um, he actually lived for four years. And I will tell you quite honestly, that was a mixed blessing for us because, you know, watching someone you love suffer, um, and he did suffer quite a bit in the last three years of his life, he had full-blown dementia and he was in a great deal of pain. Um, So that's difficult. So, you know, if you ask me, you know, are you glad that he had those additional three years? It's tough for me to say yes, you know, watching him suffer the way that I did. Um, So my parents, in contrast to uh, the story that Gretchen told, did not do a great job with planning. So they were your typical, um, you know, first generation immigrants. They arrived to this country and worked incredibly hard. My dad worked, I would say, 12 to 14 hours every day, seven days a week. So his only focus was providing for his family, you know, making sure that we all received a good education and, you know, your typical American dream. And because of that, there were certain things that fell through the cracks. So there there was no health care directive. There was no will or powers of attorney. We didn't have even any insurance. So um, there was no health care insurance, life insurance, long term care, no safety net. So by the time my dad actually got sick, my mom was in, um, I guess, disaster mode. So there was no preparation because, you know, they never believed something like this could happen. So her sole focus was keep him alive, keep him alive, keep him alive. And, you know, bear in mind, the doctors were telling us prepare for him to to go transition in less than a year. But, you know, because her, you know, we were prepared for this. So her attitude was no matter what I need to do, I'm going to keep my husband alive. So she took a second and third mortgage out on the house and pretty much sold off all the assets that she possibly could. And um, knowing my dad the way that I did, I will tell you, had he had a voice in this, had, had, had there been a healthcare directive, had there been any sort of plan, he would have said, that's the last thing that I want, right? Because he knew he had really about a year to live and he knew the quality of his life was going to be severely diminished. But again, um, there wasn't planning. And so there wasn't an ability for his voice to be heard. Um, so that, I guess, was like the biggest, um, for me, uh, you know, tragedy of not doing the planning. It wasn't just the financial aspects um, or the physical. Like I said, his body had deteriorated and my mom and I ultimately had to take care of him around the clock at home. Um, and that w- that took a toll too. So statistically speaking, people who provide that sort of family care, especially around the clock are more prone to depression and they have their own physical ailments as well. Um, but our family story, ooh, sorry. So there's, Oh, there we go. It was blocked. <laughs> so um, our family story, while it, it seems dramatic, it, it's dramatic for me because I experienced it, but it's by no means uncommon. So 70% of people age 65 and older are going to need some form of care with everyday activities, getting dressed, going to the doctor. And this is according to the Department of Health and Human Services. And as Dr. Madison mentioned, we're living longer, right? So with that come other consequences with respect to our health. And so as we age as a population, those numbers are only going to go up. Um, And then 62% of personal bankruptcies in this country are due to medical expenses. And that's according to a recent Harvard study. And those numbers are also consistent with what's been happening for the last several years. Um, Some common misconceptions a lot of people have about an event like this, whether it's dementia or other sort of long-term sort of ailment, ailment, um, is that Medicare or a Medicare supplement We'll pay for that, right? So people assume if you're covered under Medicare as your primary health care provider, Medicare will also uh, provide for your long-term care expenses. And that's simply not true. Medicare really provides only for a very small portion of it. Um, the biggest payer of long-term care costs is actually Medicaid, or in California's case, it's Medi-Cal. So uh, Medi-Cal currently pays two-thirds of all long-term care costs right now, which is great because at least it provides some safety net. Um, But the problem is Medi-Cal requires you to spend down nearly all of your assets in order to qualify. And, you know, for most of us, if we get sick, we want to be cared for in our homes, right? We want someone to come in and provide that assistance. Uh, Medi-Cal doesn't provide that to you as an option. So you would have to go to a Medi-Cal approved facility and stay there. And in, you know, the state of California, there's quite a long waiting list for those facilities. So it's not an ideal option. It's sort of the last stop if you have no other option. And the other problem with Medi-Cal is that it requires, because you're spending now nearly all of your assets, that puts your spouse, if you have one, in a precarious situation financially because you're ba- you're basically spending down all of your family assets as well. Um, 
So what, what are we talking about in terms of numbers? And this is for memory care. Um, so it tends to be more expensive, but for in-home care, it's about $39 per hour. For eight hours a day, that's $120,000 per year. If you were to stay in a nursing home, that could run anywhere from 156 to $192,000 per year. And these numbers are pretty consistent. I have a friend actually in Chicago, her dad, who was 79 years old at the time, very active, very healthy, would exercise every single day and was actually taking care of his wife, who was, you know, um, needed, needed a little bit more assistance. And because he was so healthy and strong, he was able to provide that for her. He uh, slipped on black ice. If you know anything about black ice in Chicago, it's incredibly dangerous. He had a freak accident and he became a qu uh, quadriplegic as a result, which, you know, and he's been like that for the last five years. So he is someone now who went from being completely healthy to now being a quadriplegic needing 24 hour care from nurses. And that cost is $360,000 per year, which for most families, that's a that's an astronomical number. And he's been, they've had that care for him for the last five years. And fortunately for him, so even after his own money had been pretty much spent for the first several years, his three children who also, you know, they earn a good living. So they're able to pick up that tab of 360. So they're each paying $120,000 per year, which is great. It's, he's very, very fortunate, right? Um, and what's also fortunate is all three children were on the same page as far as how are we going to handle this, you know, this problem, this issue. Um, and, you know, they're willing to do it. They're, they're able to do it, but not everyone is quite that fortunate financially. Um, so for those who don't have, you know, those sorts of resources through their children, um, what's the easiest thing that they can do? They can create a plan, right? We all can create a plan. Um, we take it for granted that if we're in this country, you know, if you get into a car accident, you have car insurance. If your home burns down, you have homeowner's insurance. With um, most seniors, they have Medicare and their Medicare supplements. We take all of those things for granted, but we don't do that with a long-term care type of event or dementia. And that's easy to insure with uh, long-term care insurance or a hybrid type product. To, so basically transferring the risk to an insurance company. Um, another option, if you're opposed to the insurance, is to self-insure, um, designating a specific bucket of funds, you know, purely for long-term care, um, separate from other sort of medical and other expenses that you would have during um, retirement. Um, and then the, the third thing that I think is incredibly important is having um, your conversation with your family members. Gretchen mentioned having the team and having, you know, whether the family members act at, in some capacity with the attorneys or the CPAs, the financial advisors, having them know exactly what's, what's happening from a financial st standpoint is very important. But I think also from a strategic standpoint, so let's say you're not able, you didn't buy the insurance, you didn't set aside a fund, you didn't do any of those things. Having the conversation with your family, whether it's with your children, with your siblings, with your nieces and nephews to say, listen, at some point in the future, this could happen, right? And I would love if you're able to step up and help me with this. I think that for me is one of the most important conversations to have so that everyone is on the same page. Um, and I'll give you an example. Uh, my former mother-in-law 20 years ago wanted uh, me to sell her long-term care insurance. And one of my um, ex-sisters-in-law said, well, why do you need that? We have There's 10 children. So my ex-husband is one of 10 children. And they said, surely with 10 children, We'll have no problem, you know, someone will step up to the plate and, you know, we'll divide the work, et cetera, et cetera. Well, fast forward 18 years and, um, you know, my former mother-in-law uh, broke her hip when she fell down. Fortunately, there was the insurance, but like most insurance, there's a 90 day waiting period. So all the family needed to do was just, you know, provide assistance to the dad for 90 days. And as I mentioned, there's 10 children, um, but there was no plan. There was no, okay, in the event this happens, who's going to do what? And instead of 10 children, like wanting to, to provide that aid, three children provided aid, right? And as a result, they, they did pretty much everything. Again, my mother, you know, former mother-in-law needed round the clock care. You know, the dad couldn't do everything. So three children stepped up and seven children did not. And even after my mother, you know, former mother-in-law passed, it created a lot of resentment within the family. That why is it that, you know, all the burden fell on just the three of us and no one else did anything. And so to avoid a lot of these 
types of conversations, um, that that's uncomfortable. No one wants to have this sort of discussion after the fact. If they would have had the discussion before, right, to say, listen, here's what the situation, if this situation happens, who's going to do what and have that sort of game plan. It's really, to me, no different than, you know, we're taught as children, if an earthquake happens, what do you do? You know, if this happens, what do you do? Well, we don't have a similar plan for something to me that's more important, um, which is if your family member gets sick, what do you do? How do we handle it? Who's going to do what? Um, so for me, um, it's a like I said, it's a very personal discussion. Um, again, very um, uncomfortable for a lot of people, but I'm glad that we're at least having this discussion now. So hopefully you'll go home and start that conversation with your own families. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. And like Gretchen, she manages well, so she has to have a lot of documents in place and direction. When someone needs to use their insurance, what do the insurance companies need to have in place if someone, you know, can't act on their own behalf? Yeah, they need a they need a uh, financial power of attorney so that someone else can act in their behalf. Mm -hmm. So when you're filing a claim, uh, someone needs to come in and and say, I have, the, you know, here's the power of attorney so they can speak for the individual if they can't speak for themselves because of dementia or some other issue. Um, but again, it's sort of the, the pre-planning of designated such a person, right? That's, that's part of this discussion, making sure you do that. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for sharing your expertise and your experiences with us. And uh, let's take some questions from the audience now. Um, we have the first question directed to Dr. Madison, and that is, you mentioned about being tested. What is a good age um, to start being tested for memory issues? Well, that's a good question. Uh, and there isn't any specific age that is agreed on. However, 65 is a typical sort of a cutoff point. Uh, you can do that self-assessment that I shared with you. Uh, some people worry about getting cognitive testing if there's a problem that, that, that gets into their medical record and it could then affect their ability to get long-term care insurance. Mm -hmm. um, but always, let's keep going back to the theme here, do it now and get it done early. So around 65 or so. Thank you. And I think, Natalie, it might be good for you to chime in on this, too. Um, how, do, how do the insurance companies view, you know, information in the records about memory issues? Um, they don't view it very well, I'll tell you that. So 50% of all uh, insurance claims are related to dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, so they're, the insurance companies are very sensitive to the fact that this is a growing problem. I think Dr. Madison said there's every minute someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, insurance companies know that those statistics as well. So they're very leery of insuring anyone who has any potential of having, you know, dementia. In fact, one insurance company has specifically said at last year that if a family member has dementia, you're less likely to, you, you can't get the full coverage. If two immediate family members have it, you can't get any coverage. So that may be an indicator where the industry is going. So better to do this sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Good. And Gretchen, um, in terms of planning for, you know, uh, cognitive decline or other chronic illness, um, someone asked, my wife and I are planning to sell our vacation home and that will be the funds that will pay for our care. Do you think that's a good idea or should we buy mm -hmm. insurance? So you're, the question is about self-insuring with assets that you own today. And it sounds like in, specifically for them, it's an asset that's their vacation home. Um, <clears throat> I don't know the couple well, so I don't know their exact situation, but I can extrapolate a story that they the family enjoys the vacation home together the couple probably has fond memories of being in the vacation home together. And at the point where it becomes clear that they need care, they may not have the cognitive ability to go through all the steps that it takes 
to put a piece of property up for sale, work with a real estate agent on that, negotiate financial terms, handle the proceeds, know what to do with the proceeds and how then to use them for ongoing cash flow for care. It could be asking too much of someone at the point where they need care to then also deal with a financial transaction. So I guess my advice would be that if you are intending to sell the vacation home as an asset for future care, plan to do that while you are in full capacity of making that financial decision and you know that you will do it in a smart way and then invest the proceeds in a way that they'll be there for the future. If you're not sure that's really realistic and your family might enjoy having the vacation home together, having long-term care insurance and spending the money on the premiums for long-term care insurance instead is a great alternative. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's more, this is for Dr. Madison. And I, I would say most people are worried about being in a nursing home. And so the question is, I never want to be in a nursing home. So how can I make sure my family never puts me in a nursing home? Well, there are no absolute certainties in life, so there are no nevers. Mm -hmm. uh, anything can happen. And I frequently have a conversation with families that if you choose to continue to live in your home, you need to understand and accept the risk that if you fall down the stairs and break your hip, you are going to most likely end up in the hospital and in a nursing home for at least a period of time. And you may not have a choice to go back to your home. So writing down and sharing with family members that preference that you don't ever want to go into a nursing home is the only way to reduce the likelihood that it could ever happen. Uh, the prepare for your care document is one way to, you know, clarify your wishes about quality versus quantity of life. In addition, people can write up very, very detailed letters um, stating they don't want to leave their home. Uh, they want medication only to relieve uh, pain or suffering and make it clear in writing that they don't ever want to be in a nursing home. Date that, sign it, and share it with family members who are potentially decision makers. But there are, are no guarantees. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Um, Kind of in the same vein, Gretchen, about um, making sure things go right. Uh, we have someone who says that she'd like to get her name on her mother's checking account and investment mm -hmm. accounts so that she can help her with the bills, the investments. Her mother doesn't have dementia right now, but is that a good strategy to start early? Well, I, I certainly applaud the family's intention to help their family member, uh, the daughter's intention to help her mother early with her finances. Um, if anything, that helps her get familiar with how her mother's managing her finances. Um, however, there are some alternate options today that may be better than taking joint ownership of an investment or bank account. So if you add someone to your bank account or your investment account as a joint name, it can be considered gifting assets to them. It also can be giving them authority. So it may be better if her intention is really just to help and be aware to talk to the um, either the brokerage firm or the bank about getting what's called a view only access. I mean, since we do so much online these days, there are a lot of security levels put in place to allow people to view accounts online. And it's actually making it easier, I think, for family members to help their parents, especially by just being able to view the account. Um, also, I believe there are banks that will allow someone to be a signer on a checking account without being an owner of the checking account. So if you're if you're ready to help your parent with their investment accounts, I think first place to go is the the uh, brokerage firm or the custodian of the of the assets or the bank and ask them what the options are that create the most flexibility um, for you. Hmm. Excellent. 
Um, and Natalie, you mentioned about Medicaid and Medi-Cal in California. Um, certainly if someone's on Medi-Cal, they are allowing the government to make decisions so you don't have too many options there. Um, but many people want the government to take care of them. And here we have a question where I really think the government should take care of us um, if we have dementia and need care for a long time. What's, what's, um, what can the government do for us? Well, so certain states are looking into this. California is one of them. Um, Washington state actually has a law on the books right now where there um, you will be taxed via payroll um, towards this fund. It's a very small fund, however, it, it covers a maximum of uh, $36,500 in benefits. So if any, you saw the numbers earlier, that's really not gonna cover very much. But I think states recognize that you can't, you know, it's the their own state Medicaid programs are going to be quickly depleted as we get older if there is no other sort of safety net. Um, so there it's, you know, it's a step, I guess, in that direction to provide something versus nothing. Um, and California is doing the same thing. We're looking to do that possibly next year and, and doing a similar payroll tax slash, you know, government um, fund for that. Does sounds limited, though. What it is. I can do. Dr. Madison, a question for you. My mother is in a nursing home and gets very confused and frantic when I'm not there. How can I reassure her that she is safe? Well, uh, it's not unusual, particularly when someone is newly arrived in, in a care facility for them to get anxious or even frantic when a loved one's not around because they don't understand where they are or why they're, why they're there. Um, as you're asking that question, though, um, you can't do anything, it, you know, right then and there when she has these behaviors when you're gone. You can instruct staff on different things that they can do and try to redirect her. Uh, Gretchen actually referred to that. I, I, I love that concept of, of not, uh, you know, taking someone's attention or directing someone's attention somewhere else rather than pulling them away from something. So mm -hmm. giving activities uh, uh, or outings uh, is a good way to distract that person from the fact that you, the daughter, is no longer with them there. Uh, try and identify what is causing this? Uh, is it happening at a certain time of day? Is there anything else going on in routines around the facility that can be contributing to it? Uh, and sometimes people do need medications because with neurodegenerative conditions, there are changes in the balance of neurochemicals in the brain. And some medications help reset that balance and reduce overall level of anxiety. That's not always the case. So there's a lot of different ways to approach this. And I hope I've covered them for you. Perfect. Perfect. Well, we have time for one last question. It's directed to Gretchen. And um, the question is, or the situation is, I manage my own money. What if something happens to me and I'm not able to manage my finances? Should I plan, plan to retain an advisor like you? And when I get to a point where I can no longer manage, you know, paying my bills or making business transactions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, again, uh, kudos to planning ahead and thinking ahead. Um, I do suggest that uh, people who are fully capable and interested and want to manage their own financial situation, that they they still have some kind of a team in place. Probably they are, they they may or may not be doing their own tax return. They might have a CPA in place. They probably have a contact at a bank or a brokerage firm. There's um there, there are at least a few people in place that should know what their plans are. They should have a trusted contact at the brokerage firm and probably at the bank. Then for setting up a backup, um, it's a good idea for a person who manages their own money to have a trust in place. And in the trust, they will designate who the successor trustee is. Um, that may also be true if they've created a durable power of attorney. They're designating who their successor decision maker is. And that person doesn't have to take on any responsibility until they're needed. Now, that could be a friend. 
Um, it could be a family member. It could be a professional fiduciary. But I would suggest um, if you're in this situation now and you are setting up those instructions and you have no idea what year, if any, you, though those people are going to need to spring into action, it's probably a nice idea to have an annual meeting with them. Just get together for coffee, um, get together for dinner, and just run them through what you're doing. Here's what I'm investing in right now. Here's what I'm thinking in terms of my cash flow needs. Here's what I've done with uh, my, my trust assets versus my retirement assets. Here's some things that I know I need to take care of. And that way, if anything were to happen, it's not been that long since they had a conversation with you and they know what it is that you would like to have happen. So if you can't meet with them often, you can also write a letter that has those instructions for them. That's Perfect. probably what I would suggest. Thank you. Thank you. So this concludes our program. Thank you so much. Our thanks to Dr. Catherine Madison, Gretchen Holstein, and Natalie O. Oh. And of course, to our online community, I'm Denise Michaud, Chair of the Grown Ups Forum. This meeting at the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned. <laughs>